I know like I was initially like, yeah, I'm down to help, <laughs> help. Yeah, for the same reasons. I thought that when you were asking for help, I uh, <laughs> I was I was really ready to help. I was really ready to 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 engage with that process. But I thought I would be engaging that process in an, in an assisting manner because uh, I was white. It was for the Asian American Student Cultural Center, and so I thought we needed somebody to help take down, bring things in their car, maybe order food, that kind of thing. And I was I was on board with that. And so when we met for our first meeting, or when you sent the follow up email, I remember you think, saying. So think about the kind of events and activities we can do. And my brain being like, oh, no, I don't know (laughs) Uh, what I would possibly do. And so I wasn't quite sure who like the audience would be or who the uh, what the who the event was for. It's like purpose. Uh, Initially, I conceived of the event as part of like intercultural week, uh, which we do on campus, uh, where they are trying to open up the center for other people to experience what they're doing in the center on a yearly basis was the initial conception that I was rolling around in my head. So I kind of thought we would be helping you give a presentation or help you set something up for <laughs> like white students or non-Asian students to learn what happens in the Asian cultural center or to learn a bit more about like Asian American cultural issues, Asian American cultural developments on campus. Yeah, I think I similarly thought that Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month would be more of like a generalized event for the university, kind of in the Mm -hmm. same way that like other like types of like months tend to be like put out for everybody. Like most everybody is usually aware when like Black History Month is happening. And I'm not sure that like this month had the same like reach Mm -hmm. on our campus at least. It was surprising to me because we were having early talks and discussions and uh, you, Dr. Sanford, you said... I think they already know what you're going, what you're sort of building and going to say in this particular project, and it, and I realized that oh, we we sure we're doing something uh, with the Asian American community, and they're going to be sort of the primary audience and the primary, which completely shifts the way you sort of think about and design one of these things. That note that you're making about how you initially were thinking that you'd be helping in a different kind of way. This says something about this kind of expectation about who can do this work or who should talk about these things. Um, and maybe there are certain assumptions there that like oftentimes people feel like if I'm not part of that group, then like what right do I have to say anything related to them? Maybe a hundred percent. Well, and I think the danger of missteps just goes through the roof. Like even, even now in this very <laughs> podcast, I'm so aware of like, <laughs> saying the wrong thing, not using the appropriate language and making sure that I'm being very careful. Yeah. And if I was at, heaven forbid, but if I was at like a white heritage month, <laughs> oh God. God, which would be really rough, right? But if I was there, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to be careful. Like you don't, that. you may have I don't have to, right? Yeah, that, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right yeah, <laughs> heaven forbid that that event would exist, but for a lot of reasons. But you understand that you are participating in an event that is affected by you, but also will affect people. And I think any event like that, even non-cultural events, when you realize that you're just entering a space where you're going to have an effect on somebody else, you know, even like teaching is always that way. I feel like this conversation also has some interesting implications for what you're bringing up about teaching in the classroom. I mean, if the assumption is that you should talk about what you know and from the perspective of the communities with which you identify, it becomes easy to leave a lot out, I think. Right. Um, And that seems to happen on such an embodied level, like this kind of nervousness about saying the wrong thing or doing it the wrong way what's well, it's, it's like an expertise thing because i mean this these are like embodied things like you're saying but the expertise of that embodiedness comes from like the year's experience of living in that community as a member of that community and so it feels quite a bit like going to speak in a classroom for which you are not the expert in the subject, like me going mm-hmm. to give a history lecture or me participating in some, some events like this feels like you're stepping outside of your expertise. And that can be real dangerous and scary. And this reminds me of some of the conversations we had in class about teaching and ways of thinking about engaging with learning um, in a different way where 
you didn't end up exactly like lecturing everyone at the event, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It became more of a, here's a topic of conversation. Here are some questions we had about it or I had about it or. In developing what I was trying to say, I think a lot of what John's saying about expertise came to me as like, okay, I don't have expertise and I'm not going to pretend like I have expertise and that's an awkward space. And I realized that's actually more in line with like how I teach than so like, (laughs) (laughs) but like I feel more comfortable in my classroom than I thought I would at this event because of all the things we're talking about, like embodied natures and stuff. And because like in a classroom, I'm always a little bit awkward. Like (laughs) it's just a fact, but I feel more like allowed to be there. And so I feel more Mm. okay telling my students, like, okay, certain like power structures are here. Mm -hmm. Um, And for some reason, I did have to kind of retool that in my brain for this event where it was like, okay, you're not an expert and you don't have to pretend to be. All you can do is present what you're like finding and what's interesting to you. And I think that's how we ended up presenting most of the things we talked about at the event was just things we found interesting and trying to communicate something about Asian American sound, not the Asian American sound, not trying to make it necessarily more than it had to be. Mm -hmm. And I think this conversation also raises um, questions about what we mean by expertise, because John, Mm -hmm. I think you have a good point about, well, some people have lived certain things and experienced certain things their whole life. So by that, um, they'll have certain knowledges that other people won't. You know, that's definitely something to acknowledge. At the same time, we all took this class. I mean, you all took this class. I guess what I'm getting at is, like, I don't think you guys were, like, at ground zero. You know what I mean? Like, you just showed up and you're like, let's talk about Asia. (laughs) (laughs) No, absolutely. (laughs) I mean, I think it would have been absolutely ludicrous before the class for us to go and try to say anything. The readings we did obviously informed that. And so often, like, when we were talking about, like, Asian American sound, I think we were, like, putting, like, an S at the end of that sentence, like, making Mm. it plural. And that comes from thinking about, like, multiple rhetorics of what it means to be Asian American. And, like, just, like, thinking about how we don't have to talk about this group as a monolith. Mm. We can talk about aspects and we can talk about characteristics without meaning meaning too much i really like that you use the word facilitator right uh because that's what it felt like when we actually got to the event and we had worked through all these issues that's what it felt like it felt like we were aiming to facilitate to not lead discussion to not be the discussion to not serve as an enricher of discussion but just to create like a space where Mm -hmm. discussion could happen i also think that the class it certainly allowed me to feel more comfortable facilitating and to do something like that because you felt like you were jumping in to listen to a conversation that had already been going for so long Mm -hmm. and you weren't lost. This also reminds me of Looming Mao's facts of essence versus facts of usage Mm -hmm. and the way that you all were facilitating your topics was a lot more in the sense of facts of usage, right? Like this is what's happening. This is how people are talking about it, not... This is the kind of like essential Asian American sound, like you were saying, Maggie. You know, once we'd all spoken and it became more of like a kind of an open dialogue in a way that like I admit that I I didn't anticipate that it would become so open. I feel like at that point, I kind of like switched into like listening gear. And I felt myself listening both as a white student and a white instructor at a predominantly white institution in a, in a mostly like not white space, which... I was hyper aware that that was like one of the few times that I've had that encounter here and really at other like schools that I've been at. And I found myself listening mostly as an instructor so that I could do better because many of the people who were talking were undergrads Mm -hmm. and those are the students I come in contact with. And it was, it was really interesting hearing, hearing them talk about what it's like to be like an Asian American hokey. (laughs) Just like (laughs) so goofy. But it felt like I, I got so much out of that part of it for me, myself. If John had the same experience. Yeah, I agree. I felt like it was more for me towards the end a listening event. 